Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we have tons of stuff. Everything we didn't get to last week. Beta development updates, World v. World AMA, very awesome fights, videos that are worth commenting about. You're going to catch it right here. Stay tuned. It's coming right up. Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here in the Sound Strategy Network in collaboration with TeamLegacy.net. I am Adam Bridger Ruzo coming to you live this evening. Every Sunday at 8 p.m. is where you can find us here, Tales of Tyria. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. Glad you got a hold of the program. If you really like it, we encourage you to hit that like button on uh, on YouTube, send us a review on iTunes, or just send us feedback. Tell us what you like, what you'd like to see more of. Feedback at TalesOfTeria.com is how you can get a hold of us. We've also got a donation button on our uh, website if you, should, uh, if you should feel like it. So feel free, but do not feel obligated. I uh, would like to introduce our co-hosts we have sitting around the yeah, table with us. Apparently, okay. Great is the crasher of all streams. Welcome back. <laughs> how you doing, Great? Hey, guys. I'm glad, glad to be here again the internet is rebelling it. it's not your fault it's just that kai <laughs> is so awesome that <laughs> we, it misses her it misses her it says get great out of here all right also joining <laughs> us today freelancer welcome hey how's it going good so uh what have you been playing recently anything good uh you know i finally cracked down and got um my guild wars achievements or uh, hom stuff i was at that like you know, because I'm not a big Guild Wars 1 player. I was more of a WoW, Aeon, etc. And it's like, okay, I got to get this stupid kitten, you know, and, and, the, and the, the gear and the armor and the fiery greatsword. I mean, you got to have all that stuff. And I know you don't really have to have it, but you got to have it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am breaking down and I am going through all the other with my other guildies who have 50 out of 50. And they're like, freelancer, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. And I'm like, okay, I got it. I got it. And, and that's just been my life the last two weeks. It's been great, though. I've been having a lot of fun. All right, so let's turn over to uh, who's coming next on my screen here. Vega. Vega, welcome, sir. Hello. Good evening. So you've been playing some some uh, super Monday Night Combat with me. Tell me about that. How do you like I that have. so far? I like it. It's uh, it's chaotic. It's fast-paced. It's, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting hybrid of the whole... Dota, wait, sorry, what's what's it called, Freelancer? Not Dota. MOBA? <laughs> no, not MOBA. Are you, you talking about the, the original of the original? The original, original. Aeon of Strife, man. Aeon, Aeon, of, Strife. Aeon of Strife. Yes, AOS. the, the original AOS it's, game. That's what it's it like, is. It's like AOS meets Tower Defense meets all kinds of good stuff. That's just That's just confusing now. All right, so... <laughs> um, let us, uh, let us move into the actual Guild Wars news here today, ladies and gentlemen. We've got uh, some, something that, I mean, last week we had a, a massive show. We had a huge show. It was like three hours long. Um, and it was what, great. It was great. <laughs> it was pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> Let's do that again every weekend. Every weekend, three hours. Where's our, where's our 500 viewers like last time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you didn't think they, they were all going to come back, did you? All right, so the beta development update... Uh, posted by Eric Flanham on the blog. It came out on Tuesday right after our big show, uh, which we were promised. And it's 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 awesome. The the kind of changes that they added in here are exactly what you'd hope for. I mean, they, they talked about the, the changes to the down state. The, they had the simple problem that uh, if, if you go down and the fight moves away from you, say it's a PvE fight and somebody like drags the bad guys away or they get knocked away or something like that, and you're just sitting there on the ground... 
calling for help and nobody's there to help you, but there's no enemies to knock you down and finish you off. You're literally just sitting there waiting to die and there's nothing you can do about it. So they changed it, and this is a pretty important change. They changed it so that the last skill in the down state will allow you to revive yourself as long as nobody else is around. Now, uh, Vega, let me ask you, is that make it too easy? Does that make the game like easy mode? I can just revive myself. I, I don't think it's easy mode because what they say the cast time was. Like, it's, it's if no one touches you for whatever the cast time is of that one skill. So it's not like you could use it in the middle of a battle if someone's there that's either going to kill you or something like that. I feel that it's, it's mainly, strictly just to um, not bore you to death. And that's sort of how they've been designing the game is that they want you to keep on playing. They want you to keep on moving. And anything where you you have to sit there and watch yourself die um, goes against that. So I don't I don't consider it easy mode. Um, I think it's a good change. Freelancer, what, I don't know if uh, I believe this is also going to take place in PvP. Is this is this a problem in PvP? You think, or is it people just going to be able to use the finishing move easy enough, and it's just it's a non-issue? Uh, I think it's going to be a non-issue. I mean, you, you're only dealing with a small amount of players, so. Um, most, I don't think there's ever going to be an instance where you can't get to that one guy that's left straggling. It's a non-issue. Now, in world versus world, uh, it's sort of a non-issue there. I think the question is, does it really hurt anything? No, because those guys would have just had to respawn and come back anyway. And it seems like the amount of time it takes to revive yourself and is about the same time it would take to revive and warp back and get back into the battle anyway, so ah, it's not a big deal. That's a good point. That's a good point. It does take a while. But this yeah. does solve, you know, their, their, it solves their major problem really nicely without making it, uh, you know, really overpowered. I, I kind of agree with you here. Uh, great. any thoughts on this particular um, uh, issue before we jump into the next one? It's kind of a change that just needed to happen. And they're just doing their thing around that. It's just another example of how they look at something and they say, you know... This is good, but... And then they figure out some way to make it better. Every single time I read one of these things, it's just amazing. Uh, so now... Uh, well, not change, but just an announcement of how they've been improving things. And this is probably one of the things that they may have had, but they've just been changing it around. You can zoom the compass simply by scrolling over it, uh, moving the mouse over it, and using your mouse wheel to scroll, scroll in and out. It looks like there's about four different zoom positions on the compass. And you're able to draw and ping on the compass as well as the mini-map. This is a great little change. I mean, just uh, great. How many times can you imagine just wanting to ping, like, just right here, right near here? You don't want to open up the map and do it, right? I mean, th yeah, it's great. And it's kind of standard in a lot of things now. I know, like, Dota 2, you can draw all over the freaking map and, like, ping everywhere. And it's <laughs> it's something that's, like, you have to put in and, like... I don't know why it wasn't there originally. I guess they're just kind of it, putting, it like, just, this yeah, is not this something that had a priority. that was on the back burner, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. like something like, oh, we have to put the compass in. It has to get in today. It's definitely <laughs> something that they worked on and got it in. Yep. I, I like the little dots that show where you've traveled from. Really? Because I kind of, you didn't think that those, like, got in the way after a while? They just kind of cluttered I, up the map if you walked back and forth over and over again? I mean, I, I guess, I guess, yeah, I didn't really look at it like that. I looked at it more of a sense that, I don't know, if you were ever running around, it's like, oh, I remember seeing something, but where exactly was I? At least you kind of have, like, your path you could backtrack on. But, yeah, I didn't really think about that. If you just run around a big circle fighting something, your whole compass is just going to be cluttered with the little dots. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be nice to have, like, a toggle feature, I guess. I mean, this, none of this is really new. It's just you've had different parts of it in different games. Like, in Guild Wars 1, you could draw the little line and all that. Um, yeah. And while you can ping, I mean, in uh, in Aeon you could have pinged and stuff. It's just now they're combining it in a nice, clean being keyword interface, which is really cool. Um, it's going to be useful. It just, you have to be really careful as far as from a developer standpoint not to allow you to expand out too far on the compass, because then what's the point of pressing M or whatever it is for you know to view the whole map? Then you could just completely negate that function. I mean, they they should include a limit on that, and I, I believe they do. I think it's a fine limit what they got now, so. Yeah, they've got four zoom levels, and it looks like the level that you're looking at in that little picture there is about the 
almost the second to closest zoomed in. So I can't imagine it would get that big if you zoomed out. But I think that's that's probably just exactly what you need. The compass doesn't need to be replacing your map. It just needs to be enough area so that you can zoom in and see detail when you need it and zoom out and ping things a little bit further away when you don't. Uh, so this is a very interesting thing, the meta events they were talking about in this blog. Uh, specifically, meta events are basically dynamic events systems, like chains that affect whole regions in much larger ways. So my, my understanding of this meta event system is when multiple events all coincide to do something, it can do something massive that affects the whole region and not just a tiny little area. So rather than like, okay, this fort is now back under, you know, good guy control or it's under bad guy control or it's been destroyed. This is like the weather is changing or the entire, you know, area is now covered in zombies or some kind of crazy like large <laughs> region wide thing that's going on to these meta events. And that is very cool sounding. I mean, just from a, you know, PVE, like I want to be immersed in this world point of view. Yeah. I, think, I like it. Did somebody say... It, it, Go ahead. it seems almost like a natural sort of extension of the dynamic events. Like, dynamic events were great, and it, when they were talking about them originally, it was always, you know, so these are going to change the world around you. And that was great. It was I was just happy with, oh, I... Going back to the centaurs. I stopped the centaurs. Now I have this little vendor at the town. But now with meta events, it's just it just blew it up. And now it's even bigger and it's even greater. And I'm, I'm excited to see how they're going to change things. I mean, this is something that I saw. And Malkier just linked to this in the chat. Colin Johansson does not often post on the Guru, at least not as I've seen. I've seen Martin post a lot on there, but, Mar but Colin's been crazy on there today. And he talked about the meta events. He said, generally, you have the largest amount of world impact the, uh, of any different type of event. And this is what he posted in there. Quote, as a bonus tip, after any dynamic event or event chain, it's always a good idea to follow the key NPCs or investigate the area after the event has been completed. If you don't run off, You'll often find that they've built new buildings, set up stores, built defenses, kicked off new events, after some dialogue, of course, and repair broken things, build siege weapons, change the weather, have new spawns <laughs> appear or change, and more as a result of dynamic events concluding. That's pretty awesome. And I think the guy that posted after him sort of, sort of sums it up. Um, basically, we're, we're all sort of assuming that what we do in the world doesn't matter. And just hearing that it does matter, I don't know. It's just, it's every time I hear it, it's just crazy. I, I like can't even fathom it right now. The, the more that they keep on releasing this information, the more that it becomes more apparent that Guild Wars 2 is the MMO for people who hate MMOs right now. I think it's the RP MMO, honestly, because the world responds in an immersive way. You don't get blasted out of it. Like uh, Memelish says here, I guess we as gamers have been conditioned that if nothing happens at first glance, we automatically assume nothing is going to happen. So we leave and try to find something somewhere else. So thank you, Malkier, for the link. That's what I was looking for, actually. I was pawing around trying to find it. Let's see what else we have here. Hidden treasures. They kind of talked about uh, some of the things that you can find. And actually, did you guys see the platforming puzzle uh, basically to find a skill? Uh, oh, that was, that was so neat. All right, first it? off, oh, yeah, you, video have, of you have just a, there is there there's a, a really neat video where he's jumping along this cliffside that kind of goes over an arch that is an entrance to another zone apparently, and um, along the way he's facing all of these people that are knocking him around. That's the best part it about it. It looks like he fell off a couple of times. <laughs> it, he almost did, yeah. Um, and uh, at least the video I saw, he didn't fall off. But except the one time, but he fell to a well, lower no, but, level but of looking, this platformer. Lo yeah, looking at the uh, at at the trail that was behind him. Yeah. Uh, what I noticed was that it looked like he had fallen off and oh, on the mini map. Up. Yeah. On the mini map, it looked yeah. like before the video started, he had fallen off. Well, yeah. conveniently, he only recorded the part where he <laughs> you know, went, <laughs> did it right, <laughs> went through it the right way. So in this recorded part, he actually almost fell off one time. He had from the curse video, and I'll link this in the show notes in a minute here for anybody watching. Um, and I'm just gonna jump through to some point in the middle here while you're talking about it. Yeah, so he goes through this, uh, this, this basically finds a little niche here, you'll see in the, um, in the video where he, uh, 
Like, it's just kind of completely, you, you got to be looking for it, you know? It's not something that it, it guides you to this uh, this little side area. It doesn't say, hey, if you go here, well, you I get Well, I think the only thing is report. that on the mini map, uh, on the main map somewhere, there's a skill, you know, here, here you can see he's trying to force his way around this wreckage. Yeah. On the skills, on the, on, the, on the map somewhere, there's a skill point, and you can see it's there. You just can't figure out how to get there until you get to the map and physically try to make your way there. Yeah, but you know, it's just kind of simple, uh, simple yet complicated platforming. I think is something that you know we say a lot of things were rehashed from previous MMOs. This is something truly that you will not find in WoW, you will not find in Warhammer, you will not find in Aeon, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the the platforming mixed with MMOs. Where else have you seen that? They may have tried it in other games, but this is like true platforming here. You know, you're yeah. bouncing between different levels that would on first glance look like you know has no business being trekked upon but then along the way you're fighting these little creatures and men and, and I little think that uh, letter champions. that's on the ground is like a hint on how to get to the next place like i'm wondering if that's what it is because i see another one of these letters as he goes through the video there's another place where there's a letter that maybe he never picks it up but i'm wondering if those are pointing him in the right direction i i, I just Possibly. love this because watch it's, here he's going to activate i think an elite skill in order to get a speed boost to make it over this yeah. And so I could see builds being centered around the hardest versions of these. Imagine that, you know, a build, uh, let's say you choose a certain weapon set, maybe there's a particular trait or something. I don't know if there's anything in the game that increases move speed, but let's assume there was, you know, these kind of ultra hard, but yet simple platforming levels here are just, uh, it's just brilliant. I love it. I'm so excited I, about this. <laughs> I just love it because it's like the first time that you really get to explore something, you know? Like, yeah, you can go and run up the mountain or you could run around the town, but, you know, there's nothing to really explore. And this, you're really, you know, you're traveling through some ruins and stuff, and it's just, I think it's super cool. So, it's yeah. not the fact that you're just exploring, though. It's like you're getting rewarded for exploring, too. Because, yeah. like, the skill skill point guys at the end of that so you're gonna like complete he's like oh hey you jumped up here here's your skill point it's kind of like you're getting something for exploring rather than just yeah. like experience oh you found the, the swamp here's some experience yeah. and the yeah, ruins if I, themselves are great yeah they do and if I spend any any time outside World v. World it will be doing every single one of those <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. to say you know I, I'm sure there's going to be one that everybody's ripping their hair out people are well you can't unsubscribe you know unsubscribe to this game but you know you get the idea they will just hate Guild Wars 2 they'll be like this is so stupid because they can't get that last puzzle I will be the guy there for four hours trying to get that puzzle <laughs> so you know what I liked about that go ahead sorry <laughs> oh and I was just saying there's there's very few games um uh, that aside from Steam releasing and stuff that have really gotten s that sense of uh, uh, Super Meat Boy, anybody? You know, that getting you that, that sense of rage of just, <laughs> but it, it's a good kind of rage that makes you want to just beat it. You know, you're not going to, your wife comes up to you and says, hey, honey, dinner's ready. No, you know, I got to beat this level. <laughs> it's the totally good kind happened. of rage. And I, and I like that. I like to see that. So the thing that always struck me about that whole video is, and maybe he went about it the wrong way, but it doesn't look like a path that's just leading you from one step to the another. It looks like it's an organic, like, crumbling fortress that you somehow find your way towards the top of. It's not like, clearly, this was designed to point me in the right direction. Like, there's a well-worn path here so that I can't possibly get lost while making my way up this platforming puzzle. It's really like, okay, figure it out. It's like, we have faith, you know, trust in you, the player. It almost looks like there's just dozens of ways to, yeah. you know, obvious, obviously the NPCs are in specific locations, but from getting to NPC to NPC, it just seems like there's so many different routes you could take. Definitely. So that, that was a really cool thing to see. Uh, let's see, what else do we have next here after the hidden treasures? So skill points, I think, are going to be one of the big things you hunt for in, in Guild Wars 2. But uh, then they talked about boons and conditions. And boy, am I happy about this update. This is one of the coolest updates I've seen in a while. And this is another one of those, well, this is good, but moments from ArenaNet here. Uh, if you're not familiar with the condition system and boon system, let me quickly reiterate for you. Uh, conditions are all of the possible negative ongoing effects that can be on a player at any given moment. And boons are all of the possible positive effects that are on a player at any given moment. Think of World of Warcraft. 
how many different curses and hexes did the did the 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 warlock have? So you'd have a tiny little icon in the top corner of your screen that had some particular curse on you that was doing some percentage of some certain amount of damage per second, and then next to it were thirty other little tiny dots on you from all the other players that were trying to target you and attack you, and you had no idea what was going on because you don't memorize. Well, maybe some people do. The 30 different curses slash hexes that a warlock has, and then a shaman has more, and a priest has more. In Guild Wars 2, there are just the 10. Is it 10? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, because confusion got added. So, yes. the changes that they made were they made bleed, poison, and burning their own individual uh, conditions, basically. Before, they basically were different names for exactly the same thing. And I am so happy about that. Now, bleeding is your spike dot. It's the thing, if you can apply a lot of bleeding over somebody, they're just gonna take a lot of damage really quick. It's a spike damage. It's like, over five seconds, you just get hit hard. Poison is stacks in duration. So if you get hit with poison over and over and over again, that's going to stack how long it stays on you. So if a thief or a necromancer or somebody, they combine to put like four stacks of poison on you, you're going to have that dot ticking away for the same 10 damage per second, but now instead of lasting for five seconds, now it lasts for 20 seconds or something like that. Now, what's the big deal? What's the difference? The difference is that poison by 33%, meaning I believe your own self-heal is reduced and heals when you're trying to heal other people is reduced. So that's kind of a cool effect. Burning stacks in duration, so it's just strictly long-term damage if you get a lot of burning on you. Uh, let's see. They didn't really change crippling. Chill is pretty much the same as well. Those boats kind of slow you down. Chill does a better job of it, and it slows down your cooldown on your skill reset. Immobilize is the same. Weakness is interesting. It no longer does a flat damage uh, reduction. Now, instead, it seems like they've added a little bit of RNG into this. Let me ask you guys how you think about this. Before, when you cast weakness on somebody, they did flat 20% less damage for the duration of the weakness condition. Now, attacks result in a glancing blow 50% of the time. Uh, which is, glancing blow is, is is if you don't quite hit your target with a melee attack, for example, uh, you'll get a glancing blow, which is kind of a new thing in, in MMOs as well. So 50% of the time, instead of just having a flat damage reduction, uh, Freelancer, the almighty PvP master, what do you think about that <laughs> RNG being added to the system? Uh, that's about the same as what I'm used to from WoW, I mean, in terms of rogues and evasion. It's... Um... I mean, it's fifty percent is pretty straightforward. I mean, there's going to be times that people get hit by it and they go to attack. You know, let's say I'm I'm the thief, right? And I cast weakness, weakness, right? So I cast weakness, or I use an ability that has weakness. There's going to be I could just see it now that one time that somebody goes to attack me after getting that on them and they miss me six times in a row, and they are epic raging over it. And it's uh, you know, what can I say? It, it is RNG, but. There's going to be other times I should point when out, I... As Miane pointed out, RNG stands for Random Number Generator, for those that don't know, yeah. if you're listening to the show. Yeah, just because it says 50% of the time doesn't mean that it's going to... You know, that 50% may be, happen in the last eight attacks. You just don't know. Um, and that's just the way... That's the rule of statistics. So, it just the same as where they may miss me all the time. I may think that it's a great opening move. I use it on this warrior who I know is going to pummel my face if I get, you know, within melee range or however it works and then he turns around into every following attack he he uses you know connects solid you know and i just get you know face rolled and you know that that's that's rng for you i mean people are going to complain about it it's it's inevitable but now yeah, let me let me else? let me put the question out to uh let's let's start with uh with great now compared to a purely random number generator, or at least as close as you can get, I realize pseudo random number or whatever, but compared to a pure 50% random number generator, flipping a coin, and every time, maybe it comes up heads 10 times in a row this time, would you be in favor of changing that so that 50% of the time over 10, the next 10 attacks or whatever, five attacks or six attacks, uh, it forces it to make sure it's going to be a 50-50 split? What do you think? Sort of a semi-random well, I mean, it. I don't know. I don't know if I do that because for for this ability, like the this uh, condition, what really sticks out to me is the endurance regeneration. Yeah, we didn't talk slow. about that yet, but that's very cool. Yeah, it's, that's, it's like but, oh, you're gonna dodge less, ha <laughs> ha. But for the RNG thing, I mean, it was pretty just like twenty damage percent reduction. Now it's like 
you do less damage on attack. So I don't know if like changing the wording of the number would work. I, I think it's as fine as it is right now. I mean, they said they don't... I think it's what they said, but they don't want to focus a lot on like RNG stuff, but I mean, one or two isn't going to throw a whole game off. True. True enough. Now, it might even be that what they were planning on doing is 50% of the time when they say that, what they mean is every other attack. So it's not a random number at all. It's just every other attack for a certain duration, like 5 or 10 seconds or what have you. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be the case because then they then I know somebody like myself would plan entire sub, you know, executions out just for the fact that if I knew I was, you know, I had that on me. Uh, but that won't happen. Would I that mean, raise or lower the skill ceiling if that was the case? Oh, that would raise it in, in tremendously. I mean, if I know that every other attack I make, if are we assuming it's skills or just any attack? I mean, well, if yeah, I know, every skill, every skill that you use, yeah. Yeah, if I know every other skill that I that I cast or I attack with is going to hit or not hit, or I'm sorry, glancing blow, which is I think like three quarters normal damage. Am I right? I don't know exactly something like that. Or, yeah, it's less damage. Um, it, yeah, it's not it's not tremendously you know less. I just know that my most powerful nuking skills you know I will line up. That yeah, that's that's all about skill sailing because the average player is derp derp. You know he's not going to care. He, he sees weakness on him and okay, and he's going to continue his normal routine. Whereas uh, I, I hope there's a lot of players like me. Most players, especially those know that I need to line up my skills in this order. So uh, that won't happen. <laughs> you don't think it will it happen because no, it, it it's too happen. good for the skill ceiling? Uh, I just think, I think that kind of... I don't of want to the enrage whole... the entire community, but, yeah. <laughs> You're like, well, I would want it, but I it, don't think let, other Let's just put it like it. this. It, it, it complicates things to a point where most MMO players will say, that's too much to take a hold of. That's probably true. It's probably yeah, just I, a straight I, random number generator. Go ahead, Vega. I, I think that... Yeah, having the straight note random number generator is, I guess, in a sense, a little bit more realistic. I, I, I don't like using the term realistic and when it comes to gaming, but if you had a weakness on you, it wouldn't be like, well, this attack's going to do good damage, and this next one's not. And then this one's going to do good damage, and then this one's not. You know, it, like, the random number helps a little bit in that. But I think the reason why people might get turned off at the whole glancing blow 50% thing is because they might be thinking in terms of how previous MMOs, um, how the combat was in those MMOs in the sense that it wasn't as fast as Guild Wars 2. So in a sense that, yeah, you might be, you're, you're going to have a glancing blow 50% of the time, but you're doing, you know, two, 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 double the amount of attacks per second than you would in a normal MMO. So that 50% kicks in a lot more. And so it, I guess it's not really that big of a game breaker I guess. I, I don't know. I played a lot of I was an assassin in Aeon and their uh combat with an assassin when I'm getting onto anybody um is usually over within three seconds. You know, and a lot of my <laughs> a lot of my skills with an assassin they had in, in Aeon they had these this weird mechanic and I never liked it even though I, I was good at it was where you'd have to knock up your enemy. You knocked them up in the air and that was kinda like this stun, right? Um and all all of that leading up to knocking them up in the air so that you could do even more damage um, or follow up with an aerial attack uh, was all was for the majority are all RNG. It was like all chance percentages that you would do this or do this, and every nearly every attack I had on my skill bar was a chance to knock them up. Did I like that? It's, it was one of the things you got used to, but I think most people didn't like that. So I hope they don't go too too <laughs> too forward with. Um, you know, the whole RNG thing. Just the fact that they have the one weakness is nice. I would have preferred if it was set, like, the next three attacks are weak. You know, because if, mm -hmm. if you... Imagine if this were considered, like, a, a, a realistic scenario. If I do something that makes somebody weak, they're weak. You know, it doesn't mean that they may be weak. <laughs> they're, they're weak. If I shoot an arrow in their knee... In their knee. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did not. Oh, no, he did not. <laughs> Off the podcast with you. <laughs> oh, God. I'm done. I'm done. I, I, think right. it, I think they kind of changed the focus to the whole endurance re regeneration slowed thing. That's definitely right. very interesting. The, the weakness yeah. is not just the damage reduction now. It's also – so it, it's, it's now – it yep. used to be only a defensive move, right? You made somebody weak, and now that person can't hurt you. But now weakness also – is lowers the enemy's defense insofar as they cannot dodge as much because their endurance regeneration is slowed and endurance being the, the what they call the dodge bar now is the endurance bar mm -hmm. yeah 
Okay, so that's let's, the real power of that. That is definitely. Hands down. We'll see how much it reduces it, but that's that's interesting. So vulnerable is the next one here that they talked about. It used to just lower flat armor reduction, make it easier to hit somebody, and it did not stack. Now it's allowed to stack, but they lowered the initial amount, so you can, let's say it did, I don't know, 20% armor reduction before. I'm just making up a number. And uh, now it may only do 5%, but it's allowed to stack, and maybe it can go past the 20%. Again, just completely made up numbers, but just to illustrate what it does. So that's a pretty interesting change. It allows for, creates moments of super high vulnerability. So if you can get your, you know, three friends to all cast vulnerability on the boss at exactly the right moment, and then cast your biggest nukes for that three second window when it's super vulnerable, that's kind of a cool little uh, sit system that you can try to set up, and, and I like that change. So, not much more to say on that there. Uh, blind? Still is the same. Your next attack misses. Fear is the same. And they added the confusion, which we heard about when we heard about the Mesmer. So that's pretty much all the different conditions. And you can read more about that on the blog. Boons. Not too much boons change. Uh, let's see. Regeneration, X health per second. Is there anything in here that really was worth talking about? Swiftness actually got a bit of a boost. It used to be only 25% movement speed increase. Now it's 33% movement increase. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, and they added a new one. Retaliation does X damage to an opponent each time they hit you. So that's basically thorns, or the equivalent of thorns, uh, for all intents and purposes. Got a question. Do we know of any AOE fears equivalent to that of what the priest and warlock, etc., had in WoW? Or is it all single target fears so far? You know, I don't know. I haven't really studied the Necromancer, which I think if anybody has an AoE fear, it's probably going to be the Necromancer. Chat room, help us out. You guys have studied all of the things, right? <laughs> take us, take yeah, us, I, th uh, I think the Warrior does have one. They have like a shout, a shout where they make everyone weak and then they are feared, but I'm not sure if that's actually a, the condition or it's just like flavor text. They, <laughs> they are feared at that moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the chat room came to life and all say Lich form. So here ah. we got here we got um, a fear. Intents and purposes, a true AOE fear. Do you think we're going to get as much fee uh, negative feedback about this in Guild Wars Two as we have in every other game that's had such a fear? It's going to be worse. Why I said Necro is going to be called OP. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed this the other day, but in one of the videos, fear. You can walk right off a ledge when you're feared. So it's going to be even more. <laughs> OP, whatever you want to call it. In this so game. Necros are just going to hang out by cliffs. Necros will hang out by I just got some awful flashbacks of uh, first shamans and WoW in Battleground just sending people flying into the cliffs with their <laughs> skills. And also, uh, there was a, a class called an Archmage when I played Warhammer that had this mm -hmm. uh, skill called Cleansing Flare. It was a, such a unique skill. It was, one of the, it was one of a kind where you cast it and it sent everybody flying off the edge of cliffs. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, it, was, and it, was, it was so... Everybody looked down on it and it's Stuff. And so I could just see it, uh, the Necro for the same reason. Malkir says, mind control someone off of Thunder Bluff. Best experience ever. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, that's the update, uh, the beta development update there. And uh, there was, shortly after that, a interesting thing. Let's talk about this. The beta signups came up this past week, and if you you missed that part, and if you're like, wait a minute, there were beta signups? It was 48 hours only, last uh, Wednesday through Friday. They extended Get out from it under your rock. a tiny bit more than 48 <laughs> hours, and they reached over a million beta signups. Now, that number might be slightly inflated from the super fans going, um... Let me just get my other email address here. <laughs> Let me ask, do you guys think they put like a hashtag in there to try and hash people's computer, uh, and, and maybe people don't know what I'm saying, to try and create a unique identifier on each person's computer to make sure they yes, didn't sign up I more do. than once? I do. Because um, you, you got to remember that, that you did, you ran this, uh, what was the name of that program you had to run? Scantron. Um, Scantron. Scannertron. Scannertron, I guarantee, made some sort of unique idea of your system specs. You know, that alone. Plus, if you go in through IP addresses, you go through MAC addresses, uh, you go through all sorts of other things. They're not stupid. I mean, uh, all of these cutesy uh, people out there that thought they could sign up with ten different emails, go for it. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> laugh. I mean, and you know, and the other side of that is ArenaNet probably counted those. You know, just for the sake of saying we have a million, but. 
Uh, Apparently, uh, on ArenaNet Twitter, they said you could sign up more than once as long as you use a different email and a different computer. Which makes sense, because, yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> the goal for them is to try and test it on specific machines that maybe are not represented yet. We don't have enough people with this graphics card and this processor. We need to see how it performs on these. So they go into this million signups, and they try to find the computers that fit this profile. And so having people sign up multiple computers, from their point of view, is actually a really good thing, because it means that they can get a better idea of which computers are possible to be tested. So I, I assume they probably don't mind that much as long as you are putting up different computers it really just adds to their database you could see someone yeah, in does. best buy like running around all the computers <laughs> that's what i was planning on doing <laughs> like oh my god i gotta go sign up. i had an idea for the beginning of this show to have why like, didn't a... i think of that yeah right <laughs> you only need to spend like four four uh, like a grand per uh, per beta sign up <laughs> that's it that's all so go to uh, all the best buys and yes sign up with all their laptops <laughs> all right so that was pretty cool. And if you haven't seen it, I got a link in the show notes there to their reaction video, uh, which is basically the ArenaNet staff like all gathered around a big screen showing the number of signups as it co- slowly climbs towards a million. And then they all go, yeah, and they clap. And that's all there is to it. It's really not worth watching. I just thought it was cool anyway. <laughs> nothing happens. They just clap. So, all right. There's, yeah. a, there's a fight on a link here by a very skilled warrior that actually shows some really interesting combat. I'll pull it up here for a second. And this was, who is this by? Uh, Aurora TV, I had never heard of before, but the link is in the show notes. So let me let me throw this on here and you can see this. This is a level six warrior fighting a level 11 champion, which is the version of elite monsters. And you'll notice he is dodging every attack, sometimes not just by dodging, but just by walking out of the way. And he has successfully avoided all damage so far from something that's five levels higher than him. And he's doing basically no damage every time he hits it. But if he could just keep on keeping this on, he would eventually take it down. And at this point, another uh, much higher level player comes to help tank it for him. So yeah, they eventually I gotta, take I it down s- together. I gotta say, of all the videos we've watched over the last week, you know, countless hours of just face palming watching these players <laughs> and these these press guys uh you know try to play their classes this guy here is my new favorite i will i've already subscribed to his youtube channel i don't even know if this is truly his video or not it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah, right? this is by far the best combat i've seen is in terms of just basic mechanics uh, that separates you know uh all of you, G, you know, GBG players, you know what I'm talking about. All of you arena players, you know what I'm talking about. There's just certain things that somebody that understands the game will do that other players, uh, such as press beta invites, <laughs> do not do. This guy does it right. So um, he does it right there exactly at the right moment. He never took yeah. a single hit this entire fight. Granted, for a chunk of the fight, the boss was attacking somebody else, but for a good chunk of it, it was attacking him. So that is really cool and very encouraging because it means that the fights won't just be like this mindless, the PvE fights, I should say. PvP fights in WoW were at least very, mo- you know, to some extent pretty mobile and very active. You had to try to anticipate what your opponent was going to do. But the PvE fights, just the general questing in World of Warcraft or any of the other MMOs, as far as I could tell, is really just so much stand there and hit numbers. There's no dodging. There's no moving. You just hit numbers. And this just goes to show how much more interesting. Like, you can't just fall asleep at the keyboard hitting numbers. You can't just face roll. you got to be careful on where you're positioning is and know when to use your dodge oh it's just so awesome i, I think yeah, that's why a lot of the press people were just standing there is because they're like oh this is an mmo i'm just supposed to sit here and push the one button and just keep on keep on and but... the yogs cast where they figured out oh i think oh, i we... should probably dodge that fire dodge. thing <laughs> yeah like the, the, oh. blatant, the blatant animation that takes like a second and a half for two seconds to cast and the guy's just like huh Oh, the fire! It hurts. I can dodge. <laughs> I didn't. I forgot I could do that. Yeah, they point out the dodge button. He's like, "Oh, I should probably be dodging out of that then." Uh, all right. So, <laughs> Gigawatts <laughs> raging in the chat there. Um, so let's see. What else do we have here? So this is an interesting point. Uh, I, I think I was watching the the Total Biscuit uh, UI, and they were talking about how you cannot access your inventory while in combat. That's probably standard. Uh, but that kind of just made me think that you know, oh, you know. 
jerk off in your group goes to pick up new loot that he's that he's gotten while uh, while you're trying to finish fighting the boss or something and just sits there for 10 minutes trying to decide if it's better or worse than his other stuff and is being useless to the team and you don't get your <laughs> rewards until after too that just goes you know that just eliminates that problem that's something that i like i don't know why i put that in the notes <laughs> i didn't even i didn't even think about it from that point of view but yeah that i like that now <laughs> it's one of those little minute things you know that's kind of like neat you know and there's no real drawback to it I mean, think about why you would need to access your inventory in the middle of killing a boss. Exactly. You can't change you know? weapons. You can only do your two weapon swaps. You can't set new weapons into those sets, so there's no reason to go in the inventory at that point. It's the little yeah. things that matter. Indeed. <laughs> So, like not opening your inventory. If you're if you're if you didn't really get a chance to read anything, uh, I highly recommend. Even if you have did get a chance to read something, on Zam.com, the writer Pwiff, P W Y F F, uh, apparently is some uh, of some note, and he did some really really good writing here on this particular story. It's 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 not like OMG Guild Wars 2 is a revolution. Let me tell you about why it's so great. He really tries to get down and dirty and says I I've learned about this game and I wanted to see if it lives up to the hype that exists. And in some areas he says yes it does absolutely. In other areas is like well it doesn't quite get there, but it's still pretty good. So he he does give sort of a a more critical review of the game as it were. Uh, let me just look at this first opening paragraph. I have to say, in all the time of reading gaming journalism, I have not heard this quality of writing except out of Tycho from Penny Arcade, because that man has a way with words. But let me just say this, quote, ever since ArenaNet took to the blogs to discuss at length how they were going to challenge MMORPG stereotypes, Guild Wars 2 has walked the path of an exponential hype machine, doubling and tripling its expected potential each time a new post has appeared. Heck, even a cynical MMO gamer who's heard the term revolutionary so many times, I just want to buy everybody a thesaurus. I'll admit that deep in my heart, a cautious optimism was feeding on the alluring rhetoric of those developer posts. Ultimately, I went into Guild Wars 2 press beta with the mind of a cautious skeptic. I wanted to believe, but I really didn't know if ArenaNet could deliver on those promises. Unquote. I'm just, I'm just seeing like an Exiles poster on the wall. I know, right? I want says, to believe I want in to Guild believe. Wars 2. <laughs> I'm such a nerd. I'm sorry. I believe in Sherlock Holmes. So anyway, this is a fantastic read, and I highly recommend it. The link is in the show notes, so go ahead and check out the show notes. They're at the bottom of the description there of the uh, of the YouTube video. If you're watching that now, they're also on TalesOfTeria.com under this particular video, show number 20. So I just wanted to, to mention that because it's so such a good read. Anyway, later on in the week, we have some more news. Mike Ferguson comes to take our questions in uh, World vs. World AMA on Reddit, Ask Me Anything. But first, he wanted to give some clarifications about uh, people that had been reading all the news and had some misconceptions. So the first thing we learned was about Siege Blueprints. Now, we already kind of knew some of the details he gives here. They have some cost, and they said the, the reason that Siege have some cost is because they didn't want to just have the... You, you 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 slow the amount of supply of something as you or you just raise the price bam done uh, the bonuses this is kind of interesting so we now know that world versus world will give server wide bonuses for the entire server and they will work in both PVE and world versus world and these bonuses range from increased chance of crit during crafting to increased experience gain to increased magic find those kind of things then there are the bonuses that your server earns by claiming orbs of power, and that only applies in World vs. World. I assume across every map. Does that make sense? Does everybody agree that seems to be these orbs apply to the entire World vs. World battle? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much. I mean, you figure, what, there's only three of them, right? Is yep. that what we understand? And... I, I would. I mean, I don't think they would force you to carry them to each zone. I would imagine that once you hold them in a... I don't think uh, you can get them from zone to zone. I agree with you. Yeah, so I would imagine that, you know, what about that central zone? That's going to be the hot, you know, the hottest of hot spots. So it, it's got to be, you know, where it just affects the entire, you know, setup all, all together, all of World v. World. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so what else did they put in here? 
Uh, then there is the guild bonuses. These bonuses are earned by guilds researching them. We talked about that last week a little bit. They place on an objective, and this applies to anyone from the same world as the guild, but only in the vicinity of the claimed objective. So that's kind of cool. So the it, you basically have a reason to let the big guilds take the big important areas because they're the only ones that are going to be able to afford to have tons and tons of buffs around the really important areas. So that's kind of an interesting. Uh, any any thoughts on that? I'm gonna hold my tongue on that one, Bridger. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When when, uh, when Deuces comes to knocking on our doorstep, we'll have so many buffs and upgrades. And, uh, Kai, Kai is gonna be looking at this uh, at this video later. She's gonna be like freelancer. I just can't. I can't wait for it. But, He's gonna uh, rage, silent rage. No, it, it is important though, because uh, even just like towers and stuff, you know, smaller guilds will be holding those. But if you spend some time uh, thinking about what buffs you're gonna need in those areas. Um, whether I'll give you an example of an actual meta, okay? If if I know that my strategy for my guild is to claim Stone Mist Castle and then fully upgrade all the personnel, um, I'm I know that the buffs that I'm going to want to apply to that castle will you know need to be directly correlated with those personnel. Whereas you might have another guild that their mentality is we want to upgrade siege weapons to the fullest, so I'm going to apply a buff that affects that. Or you might have the third type of guild which thinks. We don't need any static defenses. The best defense is a solid offense, you know, flanking, etc. And that's great. That's I encourage that. Um, so they're going to take the buffs that encourage, let's say, a health boost or uh, a power boost. I saw that one in there. So it, it's it offers that kind of like RTS mindset, you know, where what what uh, what do we want to specialize in? And I and I like that a lot. It's pretty good. <clears throat> Abelstron says the biggest issue with small guilds egos. Will small guilds' egos be too big to allow the larger guilds to claim the most important points? Now, here is an answer that comes from the Reddit Ask Me Anything post, and that basically we learned that as a guild, uh, uh, as a capture attempt is being made on a keep or an objective, participation is being kept track of. In the same way that they keep track of participation for PvP dynamic events, the capturing of a keep or a tower or a camp is a dynamic event as far as the game mechanics are concerned, and it keeps track of participation. The guild that participates the most, i.e. does the most damage to buildings, does the most damage to the keep lord, to the walls, to the doors, that kind of thing, um, that guild gets a one-minute chance, a full minute, to claim the keep before anybody else does. After that minute, then it's free reign for everybody. So the guild that does the most contribution, theoretically probably the guild with the most people there, uh, but if maybe there's one guild that's slightly more organized and has ten less people, maybe they can pull it out ahead. Uh, they'll be able to claim it, uh, and and that is kind of nice. It just, it just avoids the problem of somebody rushing in the one person from guild I don't know who you are, comes in <laughs> at the last minute and plants the flag as soon as the keep lord dies and just says, well it's our, our keep now thanks for getting it for us guys so I'm glad they've got that in there Well do, I, do you think that just kind of throwing it out there, so if it's if, that's, if it's going by that by which guild does the most damage just straight damage then nine times out of ten it's going to be the guild that has the most people. But let's say you have a smaller guild, but they're sort of like, should it go sort of percentage-based of how many people you have in your guild and how much damage you do? So that smaller guilds could still have a chance for whatever reasons. I assume but killing defenders, killing defending NPCs, and doing damage to walls all count. Maybe even resurrecting allies near the keep would count as participation. We'd have to yeah. see. Yeah. You know, I kind of wish that, um, you know, what we know so far from the text given to us is that the the guild that does the most contribution can claim the keep. Okay, now, does that assume that if I are, if, if let's say, Team Legacy already has Stone Mist Castle and we go help these other guilds claim their own their own keeps, does that mean that Team Legacy gets first dibs on that too? I, I don't think that's got, that can't be how it works. I hope so, not. Uh, maybe you have to release... Uh, I don't know if there's a way to do it, but maybe you have to release your claim on a castle or a keep before you're being considered for that amnesty period, right? I hope yeah. that's the case, but because I, I agree then, with you, that would be a problem. And then another example would be is what if um, you know we we don't have a what's let's say we have a, a guild and we don't have a keep claimed yet, and we know that there's a certain keep somewhere that we want. We don't want this keep, but we still put put, put forth most contribution. So in 
does that assume that the second place guild that is also like right underneath this, working their hardest, you know, doing everything they should be doing, is completely at whim to randomness when uh, it goes to being claimed? Because obviously our name would pop up first, right? We go to, we get the option to claim. We say no, we don't want to. So then you have this random two man guild that has just as much chance to claim it as the guys that work just nearly just as hard as us. Yeah, and I, I kind of want to see that change. I think there should be like a second place, third place tiered order where it'll go down the list of people that don't have keeps already. And that way it, it stays sort of fair, you know. But right. And, and it, wish, it, wishful thinking. Yeah, we can hope. I mean, that's the kind of thing that can probably be patched in later. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'd be happy enough if, if at least right now, if you already own a keep, it doesn't consider you for that one minute amnesty period at all and just says you already own a keep. So you don't get to a shot at getting this one. And if you want to try to take a new keep, you have to give up an old one, for example, uh, or tower or camp, obviously. Uh, so I actually saw in the Yogg's cast, they showed um, after the keep was captured, you see these banners unfurl and there's a new guild logo. I mean, it's some kind of weird checker dot pattern, but uh, that was still kind of cool. So yeah. let's see, what else was on here? Server transfers, the big cool thing here now. We, they were talking about free server transfers, being able to change to a, visit a server for some kind of thing. Like, that was all kind of wishy-washy for a while. This has really nailed it down. And basically, here's how it works. For those of you that did not read this, very quick overview. You get a home server tied to your account, not to your character. And when you are logging in, you normally log into that home server. You can visit other servers just by I assume choosing it like probably in the same way that you chose an instance in the in the Guild Wars 1 concept it might take a little while to load in and not be quite as instantaneous and maybe maybe you have to choose it from the loading menu and say instead of going to my home server I want to go to my friend server blank or whatever you could click it up from the list so that is very cool but while visiting there you can only do PVE type activities as I understand it maybe you can do structured PvP for all I know but that, I don't think you need to <clears throat> necessarily be in the same server to do that. But you can never do world versus world on any server except your home server. And if you want to transfer your home server, that is going to have a fee. Whether that fee will be um, in-game gold or out-of-game cash money has yet to be determined, and the price has yet to be determined. So let's talk about that very quick. What do you guys think? Great. What do you think? Should it be in-game gold or should it be cash? And what do you think the um, price should be? If it's the cash. price. If it's cash, what do you think the price should be? I don't know. I don't want to pay cash for that. That's <laughs> me. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty cheap, but I, I think <laughs> it should just be... I don't know. I, I, it would be cool if it... It's probably going to be cash. That's probably what's going to come down. It's going to be cash. But it would be cool if, like, if you could use the in-game currency to like, pay for it and be like, hey, I want to go over here and... Just pay oh, for it. So you can pay wallet. like 10,000 gold or five bucks. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, some people don't like me. I don't want to pay five bucks for that. And chances are I'm going to pick one home server. And I'm probably going to stick yeah, there. Unless that's, that's my it thing. like explodes. It can probably just be cash because I can't imagine switching home servers more than once ever. In addition, as some people in the chat room have pointed out, and I should also point out, when you switch your home server, you cannot go into world versus world for that particular rotation until a new one starts and they're also continuing uh keeping it until the rotation after that for you know oh five bucks who cares i want that crafting bonus or something weird like that you know so uh i don't know what do you think vega cash or not cash uh i kind of hope that it's not cash i i don't know i find the whole cash <laughs> thing like gimmicky that i don't know like like World of Warcraft, I think they charge an obscene amount of money just to change your character to a different server. I don't know the process of what's, what it takes to do that. I'm sure it's justified, but um, I don't know. I'd like to see in-game currency, I suppose, to change your world versus world servers. Well, I think it's just already awesome that you don't have to pay or do anything to just go visit somebody else's server and play with them. That's just awesome, PvE style. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. It should be cash all the way. Uh, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here, but I, I personally, I run servers. I know what the maintenance costs are. Obviously, I mean, TeamLegacy.net, that's that's just one VPS server, and, and that's just running a 
godforsaken website these arena net is providing us a game without a monthly fee and i think a lot of people take that for granted that sure you're paying 59 or 69 or whatever it ends up being for the game but their server costs just for the first half year it has to you have to think long term and if this game is going to be as great as we all think it's going to be Aside from expansion packs, they have to be able to cover those costs. And it's ridiculous and naive to think that they can't try to charge certain extraneous stuff like that. And as long as it's stuff that you don't have to do, like you, nobody's forcing you to switch servers, you know, then I don't think it's wrong in the least bit. I think they should encourage this because then for somebody that wants to do that, they offer a little incentive to ArenaNet. It's, it's also a way of saying thanks for making such a great game. Because they're not charging you monthly for it. And I think you just have to remember that. Of all things, I would even encourage everybody to buy that extra bag if they could just to support ArenaNet. And if it was $15 cash or $25 cash, I would pay it because you truly got to understand what they're going through. Not including the development costs. I mean, how long has this game been you know, in the <laughs> making? Five years. I mean, it, it's just show some respect, guys. You know, and that's... That's my rant <laughs> for the show. Well, I, I agree with you, but I, I'm probably going to be buying stuff from the cash shop because I'd probably want to buy, you know, really cool outfits or something to wear around town. You know, I want awesome looking town clothes like a dapper top hat and a monocle <laughs> for my elementalist. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> if they have a top hat and a monocle, they're going to have all my money again. <laughs> I'm throwing money at the screen, but it's not doing anything. Take so it. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that that's kind of the thing that they offered in the cash shop for, for Guild Wars 1. They had kind of very themed costumes and, and other cool clothes. They actually had a wedding costume set you could buy so that all your characters would have as access to, like, a tuxedo and a wedding gown. If got a little, like, <laughs> got a little off. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, I got a little off-topic thing that would, would make an interesting uh, question for you, Bridger. What would you consider paying for a collector's edition of Guild Wars 2? Uh, it kind of depends uh -oh. on what it has in well, it. Well, for, for everybody in chat, and for, for you, Vega, and great, where would you draw the line at a collector's edition that you would buy? Depends what it offers. It depends what it offers. But if you give me theoretical things that it could offer. Just, and well, well, Vega, let's right, just, I'll, I'll okay. give you some example items that most MMOs do. Okay, You'll get some sort of in-game title. You may get a special emote of some sort. You're not really going to get anything as far as items. You may get like one or two cosmetic items. You're going to get a little art book. You're going to get a musical, some sort of soundtrack. I mean, it's the standard things. And you may get like a little trinket of some sort, like a Guild Wars 2, uh, you know, platinum you know, thing with Jake. So let's, let's imagine the standard stuff. What would you pay for that? Well, I was I was just having you throw that out for the other people. I personally would pay whatever the hell they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter what what doesn't matter what's in it or how much they awesome. charge for it. Wow. I'm gonna buy it. I was just I was just, just trolling just, you because the answer is infinite. <laughs> just, just just because of the fact that you know that they don't charge the monthly fee, and like you said, it's good to support them. Um, you know, there's no monthly fee. So if there was a monthly fee, then yeah, I'd be a little hesitant because then it's. All right. Well, I'm paying a hundred bucks for the collector's edition. Plus, if I want to play this game for six months, that's another how much money for you know monthly fees and all that. The fact that there is no monthly fees, I am much more willing to throw my money at them. Yeah, it, it, for me, if it was worth it, if I considered the value worth it, I would consider paying up to like a hundred dollars or something to that effect. Especially if especially if they like already included character slots because. I, I'm totally going to want to have at least eight character slots. I'm going to want one of every class so that if I ever go up against the class and I can't figure out how to beat them in structured PvP, I don't know enough for like, like a whole day until I learn the builds and, and learn exactly what the skills do and just so I can play against that class better. Even if I never wind up playing Necromancer as, as a main in any, to any logical extent, I want to be able to use their spells and figure out what their weaknesses are from physically playing as that class. So I'm going to want at least eight slots, period. So if they throw in like an extra character slot or two, I'm almost certainly going to get the collector's edition, even if it's up to like a hundred bucks. So that's my answer. Great. Did uh, you have a number? I don't have a number. I will say Evaluate though, I think the, the Skyrim collector's edition was like one one fifty, and you got like a, a stone dragon. See, I don't was need that. that. See, that's where I would draw the line. I'm like, I don't want. It. And that's all you got. You got like some dragon and a map, and that was the collector's edition. I'm like, no, I don't want that. But I know. I got I too have much faith. stuff on my walls. I have faith <laughs> in ArenaNet or NCSoft, I guess, that they'll do something in, in line with MMOs. And right. upwards, I'll give a number. I'll say I won't go over 100 
for okay. gimmicks. Yes, that's a good. That's why my number is. That's why I don't know. I, I'll I'll have to see. What if they troll you and make it one hundred and one? <laughs> I'll stand by my thing. <laughs> that's, I will that's, stand that's, by my that's, estimate. That's that's the problem, isn't it? All right, so let's let's go over the last couple points here in this uh, ArenaNet blog, and uh, then we're going to wrap it up. I think uh, we're almost at an hour here. So the other thing that they pointed out, and this is something that we sort of learned over the last week, is exactly how you tra travel from one way from one map to the other. Like it was at not at first not at all clear whether you would enter the map only at your home server and have to capture your way towards the center map, for example, or if you could just enter any of the maps from the mists. You know, you just say, I want to go to this map or I want to go to that map. And it turns out you can enter any of the maps. So theoretically, every server should be fighting on every map. There should be people from blue server on every map trying to fight. And that really increases the number of people that I thought were going to be in World vs. World. Because I was thinking, okay, the fight's always in the middle map. Why would anybody be in these side maps unless somebody's already dominating the middle map? The answer is because they can get there whenever they want. And as you can see, they've got this little portal system. And they've also pointed out that there is a sort of safe zone right near these portals so that you can't just sit by the portal killing people as they come out. So that's good news. <laughs> So I'm very happy to hear that. I just see some horrible rendition of uh, Star Wars uh, endgame PvP there. You know what the problem was with that, right? No, what was it? It was, uh, I wasn't in it, but a lot of the guildies were. And uh, I don't remember the name of the zone. I'm sure chat's going to explode here in a second. Ilium, thank you, or Ilium. Yeah. But they had uh, that issue with these spawn portals when you exit it being spawn camped on top of them. And then they made it where there was a zone there, and then they made it where it was instant death there, and it didn't stop anything. <laughs> it, it was it was a never-ending Tarn Mill versus South Shore fight of whoever crossed the line died instantly. And, <laughs> and people would just do this to farm experience or honor or whatever it was, and it, I could just see that happening there. Some guild getting cornered at one of these portals. Just think about it, you know? But at least you could port out, so it's, it's nice. Thariz... Thran is the red. Thran is the red. Thrang is the red. I guess he is red. Uh, he wants to know what about resurrecting. When you die in World vs. World, as far as I've been able to tell, you can either wait for somebody to resurrect you, obviously, or you can resurrect at any waypoint that your team controls, which means either one of those waypoints at the very entrance of the map or at a keep that has been upgraded to have a waypoint in it. When you first capture a keep, I don't think it comes with a waypoint, so you have to upgrade it to get a waypoint, and that costs supply and probably some gold as well from your guild. So that's kind of a, a cool idea. I like that, I like that. And you can't, you can't resurrect, and you can't teleport directly to towers. So that's a very interesting thing. What do you guys think about that? I mean, You know uh, what would be an even neater idea, Bridger? If I could recruit these horn blowers that would stand on my keep wall <laughs> And, and and yell to my guild chat that we are under attack or we see the enemy. That that would make my day. Bridger. You know, I, I'm guessing that your guild is going to have so, some way of knowing when your keep is under attack. They have to. I hope so because so far, I mean, I didn't see anything in the chat in the, in the beta videos I saw that claimed certain keeps were under attack except for when they were actually, you know, being halfway, the door halfway knocked down. So... Um, well, you can look at the world map and see where combat is happening, but maybe uh, yeah. maybe they just need to implement an, a notification system for your guild when your guild. But I guess I guess the idea I have is let's say I do for by some god. All right, you know, and I want to I want to do those ju those <laughs> epic jumping puzzles. So I'm in the middle of some random zone, you know, at my 400th try doing this jumping puzzle and my keeps under attack now assuming i don't have the under other hundred guild members you know around that keep and they're all doing other things i would like some sort of message via an upgrade or just built into the game that says my keeps under attack and then i could just immediately port to it and the you know, chat room is saying that does exist miane if and exists, are both saying you guys are awesome in arena i'm talking to arena you guys are awesome because i didn't see it and uh it needs to be there it was confirmed War, there were notifications if your keeps are attacked yeah, Warhammer implemented it later on after so many people called for it, and I just didn't see it so far in War or in Guild Wars 2. So, the problem that I was considering, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, but maybe like an entire a tower, right? A tower system is like sort of like a smaller keep. It's usually like a, a tower and then a small wall system, right? 
a tower is under attack. You can't teleport to the inside of it because there's no waypoint. You just can't do it. So your whole guild of like 30 people runs right next to all these oblivious guys just pounding away on the door and there's like 30 guild wide people just run past them to the sally port and enter the keep <laughs> <laughs> and then get up on the walls and shoot down at them oh and for in your point of view bridger you're not even watching them enter a sally port they're just like magically running into this wall <laughs> and disappearing, <laughs> and disappearing. <laughs> it's like Oh, and you never totally know weird. where it'll be next. Like, they could just randomly come from somewhere and just run into the wall like some, you know, Matrix-type style and just disappear. Although I think yeah. there are sally ports on more than one side of each, you know, tower. So hopefully that will make it easy enough to simply uh, have people, you know, come in from the other direction in order to get in in time before the, do the door comes down. So that's, that's going to be interesting. So the final thing that they talked about here was the population cap and basically... Uh, world versus world, if that fills up, there's not going to be an overflow server for world versus world for sort of obvious reasons, because nothing you do on that overflow server would would matter. It wouldn't contribute to your server at all. You can have overflow servers for PvE areas, but you can't do it for world versus world. So instead, if there's a world versus world map that is full, you can have players either queue up to get into that map, which means they can go do some PvE stuff while they wait or whatever, and then it'll ding, you can get in now, uh, or... Um, we will let players, uh, we hate queues as much as you do, but they're unfortunately necessary for World vs. World, so we'll be focusing on trying to get our map population cap as high as possible. They said basically 300 was how much they had on a specific map for the this past press beta. That's like the most they had on a single map, and they so they know it works for 300. They're hoping to push that limit way up to uh, five or 600, so we'll see if they do that. Uh, the day-night cycle has been confirmed to happen in World vs. World. Uh, seeing a trebuchet fire in the night is something you just have to experience, as written by the, uh, the, the post here. Now, there were a couple more things I wanted to add from the World vs. World AMA, and then we're going to get out of here, because we're already over time. We talked about the guild capture details. Uh, now, this is a very interesting thing. What do you guys think about the fact that when you die in World vs. World, it damages your equipment in the same way it does in PvE? Is this something you have a problem with? Because some people are like, "No, that's retarded." I, I think they're I think they're too casual for it already. I mean, <laughs> you are you have to die. What was it, four or five times, just to get to the point where your your equipment starts like disappearing, the stats disappear right. from you. That right there is too lenient. I mean, it, it's you should you should really get it. You should force a sense to to all the noobs out there that. Going out and running into an enemy Zerg like all these press guys are doing is a bad idea. And that unless they see like physical numbers in front of them, they're not going to listen to you in chat. I mean, we all know those kind of players. You tell them, don't do this, don't do that, and they throw all kinds of slurs and you, you know those type of players. And so going, just... to the death, going to the death screen is not punishment enough for these people. They will not learn if they simply get thrown into the death screen. Yeah, they have to have a monetary penalty is what you're saying. What you are teaching them, Bridger, is that they know that if they waste their time and waste your time, you as somebody that's trying to get things done, if they five times, they could do it five times and get away with it and not have a single penalty. Mm -hmm. but you're telling them that I have five lives so that I can completely throw myself and not give, you know, I'm careful with my words here, not give any cares at all. <laughs> I mean, you are by tell by giving that system. I think it should be either randomized or it should be stricter because you're basically telling all of the little nooblets out there that that I could do whatever I want five times going wrong. Yeah, that, but how much does it really affect you if some person you don't even know is just suiciding? Well, I, it, it was pointed right. out. I mean, it's, it's, it's just for their own, you know, yeah, so they got to do it five times. But, I mean, you and your guild, you guys are organized. If someone is just, oh, look at that guy running over and dying. Oh, there he goes again. There he goes again. It doesn't really affect you at if all. If there's no fear of it death, It does affect though, me. If there's no it's, fear, how does it affect you? There is there is a player mob uh, mentality. I I used it in Warhammer when I led raids there in, in uh, RVR, where it's called the Piranha mentality. I wrote a long guide about it, and the Piranha mentality says this: If I have an organized guild that is going to let's say a, a siege a keep, okay, and we are having this skirmish, this standoff with an enemy ra enemy zerg, and they're not organized, they don't have the assist targets and everything that we have set up, and there are random players running around, okay? 
the piranha mentality says this. If one of those random players decides to get a little too far, and he draws three of those enemy Zerg players to come after him to attack him, then other players see this from around them. So you may be part of that enemy Zerg, and you, you're whatever you know type of noob and like oh wait he's attacking he's attacking i want to have fun i'm going to join him so then you start getting this piranha mentality where all of these players start converging in on these three players or four players that are attacking this one guy that's staying outside of the organized group and then it just causes a wave of panic of players rushing to initiate a battle that should have never been initiated in the first place now whether it ends good or bad for the organized team that's another story entirely but that that would have never happened and you would have had control of the situation if you didn't have those random players screwing everything up. That's called impetuous. If you play Medieval Total War or, or Rome Total War, some of the stats on it is impetuous. They'll charge without any orders to charge. And you're like, no, don't do oh, that. I what are you that. doing? <laughs> <laughs> Greg I mean, knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> League of Legends is a great example. All right, We, we bash it a lot. We, we play a lot of fun around it. But League of Legends has the perfect example of this. It's that one guy that engages too early you know he he's the tank for example I'm you, a bear! Guys, <laughs> Vol, <laughs> Vol bear decides to uh to to rush the enemy team just because he thinks he sees an opening the piranha mentality that it's just what i call it is that all of a sudden you either are forced to engage with them or suffer a major casualty that will essentially put it at 4v5. So it, it puts you in that situation of having that noob that doesn't know what he's doing that has no sense of uh you know, if I do this, what's the penalty? That will ruin the game, and uh, and it it's not so much you know it, I'm it's a little bit more dramatic with League, obviously, because there's only five players, but it still happens in World v World, and it's still relevant. For what it's yeah, worth, yeah, it definitely it definitely makes like freelancer brings up a really good point, but I see this as also remember way back when we had the discussion about when they remove potions and energy because they wanted a long-term attrition mechanic and the potions just weren't working out well. I think this armor kind of, the armor degradation is kind of that attrition mechanic in a new form. So they want mm -hmm. you to like have to go back because you're going to die in PvP no matter what. You're going to die. Well, they also, they also, they're introducing gold into PV, into the world versus world system. And as somebody pointed out in chat, you have to have some kind of gold sink or the economy is just going to inflate exponentially. One of the gold sinks is that you have to pay for keep upgrades in, with gold and you have to pay for, I believe, with gold. And you also have to pay for siege weapons with gold. So that's one of yep. the sinks. The other sink is death tax, is you have to pay gold if you die a certain number of times to repair all your equipment. Um, actually, I believe each time that you die, something gets damaged and it costs money to repair that damaged thing. So Freelancer, even though nothing uh, mechanically happens to you those six times, each death actually does penalize you monetarily. So at the very least, it's not I get four free ones and then if I go repair, it's no problem. It's well, every one that I did get, I still have to go back and pay for it. It's just I'm not punished literally right now for it, which means that it's actually kind of a good thing because you don't want to have to go, sorry guys, I can't participate in this thing. I have to go do this first, you know, because I died one time. You know, you die, yeah. somebody resurrects you, you want to be able to continue the fight. I, I just, uh, in my own opinion, solo, I guess, in this case, I just think the death penalties that they have set out, this five to ten, you know, times you could die is just way too care bear it, it's just encourage <laughs> it's encouraging players i mean because you're talking about a repair penalty when have you ever seen a repair penalty in, in an mmo that was truly something that hurt your guilt your bank i mean come on lose a, levels when they die <laughs> no not at all it's <laughs> just it, they, they have to make one. it it's not no the they have to make it that's the thing it, it, it's it's the you're encouraging like basically lives when I think it should be more focused on they should force that mentality that I need to stick with friends to stay alive instead of saying that I can roam around and do whatever I want as but long as I only I die five that, times. I, I think there's plenty I, of penalties when you die. When you die, A, you have to respawn somewhere probably very far away from where you started unless you're defending a keep, for example. And so you're going to have to run a while. So that's a time penalty. Nobody likes to sit there and watch their character run for a while and miss all the action that's happening somewhere else. So that's A. B, you're going to have to pay for that at some point, that death. And maybe it's not going to be that much, but uh, it will still do something. And C, while you're dead, 
a ton of stuff is happening and you're not there to help your team. And of course, that third one, the people that you're talking about, they don't give a crap about that last one. They don't they, they could care less of realizing what's going on with the team because they're so egocentric. That's the people that we're talking about. So I agree with you. There has to be a death penalty and it has to be pretty harsh. But what do you think you could put in there besides monetary or time based? I mean, it, it's monetary and time based is fine, but they should increase it each and every time you die. You know, like many competitive games do, even now. Or die within increase. a certain time period. You mean? Yes. Because you know, what they, they do, is, what they do have something to that extent is when you, you know, when you go into the down state, the bar starts to go down. Every successive time you go into the down state after getting up within a certain amount of time, that bar gets smaller and smaller. So that makes no, we're you talking die about faster. dying. We're just talking, but you're about, talking about the full death. Yeah. Okay. This is these are people that are going to be bum rushing enemy zerg rage just to troll them. Okay, they will go in and cast whatever abilities they have to knock them flying all sorts of different places <laughs> just for the heck of doing it. I, I know this because I've seen it consistently in Warhammer. And these are the players that feel they can do this because why not? You know, it, it, I'm not doing anything for my team, but I'm having a good time just trying to troll the enemy team. But and I'm listen, not helping my side at all. Isn't it going to be great when the other servers are doing that, but we're going to have a guild that is disciplined enough to not do that, <laughs> and we're going to get to be like, wow, you just killed three of your guys for no reason. We'll just take your keep now. You know. I mean, okay, so your argument is because both sides have idiots that it's okay. No, I'm arguing oh, gotcha. that if you if you make a penalty so harsh that even idiots will pay will 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 pay attention to it, then you're going to make it so harsh that it way inconveniences people who are playing well when they die. I don't think so. I mean, you look at games like Eve. What happens when you die in that game? You're dead. You're dead. You lose everything except for whatever you had that wasn't on your character. What does that do for the there's game? There's less death in that game, though. Maybe not. I don't think so. I don't think so in the least bit. I think there's more death in that game. Than in a world um, versus world fight? You're You're talking... Okay, well... We can argue it both ways, but I mean, the way that Eve has their set, their death penalty set up, I'm not saying it's ideal, but the way they have done it, and it's not, maybe not the best way to do it, but the way they have done it, when you get out into a zone, I mean, how many MMOs do you walk out into a zone and you have a real sense of your well-being? And, and it's very rare that a game like Eve, if you ever played it, you'll understand what I mean, that where you enter out in that zero sect and you are truly scared for your life because you know what it what it means to die you will never have that feeling in world be world and maybe it's you know maybe that's a good thing because world be world is a casual pve but i think having some form of um you know a, at least a slightly stricter sense of knowing that if i die it means something is, is relevant so maybe, we'll, maybe, we'll agree to disagree how I, about no, I, i'm hearing what you're saying <laughs> and I, I i agree with you to a degree but what about maybe they have like a hardcore rotation of servers that basically have much stricter death penalties in world versus world? Because I do like that sense of, wow, this is really dangerous. I have to be careful. I like what that does to the environment to some degree. But when it punishes me a lot, I'm not happy about it anymore. But, you know, I do, I do understand what you're coming from. And I, could, I think I could appreciate that. You really have to find a happy medium. But I think the only way to do what you're suggesting is to have it be an option. Have a hardcore rotation of servers and have a less hard, you know, a normal rotation of servers. They could do normal and hardcore. Hardcore has very harsh death penalties where, you know, if you die, you have a chance to lose an item or something. I don't know, ridiculous. Like you said, it's going to be, you know, you have to buy insurance on your items to make sure you don't lose them or something. Something ridiculous like <laughs> Eve. So uh, that would be interesting. Or no, if you die, uh, I your guess... character's dead. You have to level up a new one, noob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's that's. Is that not the the fun of playing? Like, have you ever played hardcore? You know, have you ever wanted to, or have you ever played? If you've gotten an Eve, you have the same sense. It's that. It's a whole new level of gaming, and many, many, many mm -hmm. players don't care for it. That you know, and I and I understand that, and I'm probably talking to the ten percent that do. But there is, there is just, you have never experienced gaming at a level of when you know, I mean, you really haven't. When, and when you know that there's a real, real way to lose and just the, the feeling of gain when you do win. And I, I don't know. I, I agree but with you. I think, but, but having something like that in World vs. World, like, you're going to die in World vs. World. That's bottom yeah, line. You're going to die you a lot. Hundreds of, you have hundreds of people fighting each other. You're going to die. If you die in World vs. World, you have to spawn wherever you spawn and then haul your ass all the way back 
I think that I mean, how many times is much do you, of annoyance. How many times do we expect to die a night in like a two-hour session? You're thinking you're probably going to die maybe two, maybe three, maybe if things go really bad and you're facing a lot of opposition, maybe five or ten times. Because every time you try and go back to defend the next keep, there's a whole bunch of people there. But you're just going to do your best to keep them, slow them down as much as possible until more people from your server get on. But you're going to die five or ten times in the process of trying to slow them down. Uh, so you're basically saying, wait, well, now with this super harsh death penalty, people are going to say, oh, you know what? Nope, nope, nope. It's not worth even trying to slow them down or even trying to defend that keep because we're probably going to lose it. Therefore, I'm just going to let them take it. And now we have a, a situation where people don't want to conflict with each other, and that's not good for the design. I, I disagree with Freelancer totally on this. I don't think this is meant to be a punishment for players at all to discourage zerging. I think it's more like... I think if you're gonna zerg, <laughs> if you're gonna like, just like run in there and like keep dying, you're gonna lose all your gear and you're gonna be naked and you're not gonna get anything and you're gonna have to go out of the battle and go repair. That's what's gonna happen and you're basically gonna be useless at that point. Well, I'm just assuming gear is gonna be that important. So it's not more about like oh you have to punish them to make them play a certain way, but it's more you're you're gonna punish them by they're, if they're gonna play very recklessly, they're gonna have to leave the battle, and then you're gonna like come in with when like these twenty Zerg people or whatever are gonna push out, right. and they're gonna take an objective or something. It's not about punishment. It's more about like kind of regulate. I don't know. It's not punishment though. I think what will punish Zergs is arrow carts, as we saw <laughs> in, in those videos. Arrow carts do tons of damage. But uh, obviously, uh, we, we, we've got slightly different opinions here. I don't think we're going to reconcile it tonight. So let's, let's uh, finish up here. I like this quote, and I wanted to point this out. This is from the Reddit AMA. There is a Quaggan mercenary camp in each Borderland map that can play a pretty crucial part of assaulting or defending the keeps in that map as gaining favor with the Quaggans lets them build a weather control station that showers the nearby keep with healing rain for allies or zaps your enemies with bolts of lightning. <laughs> That's just the coolest thing ever! Oh man, I can't wait to play this game! Ugh. The last couple of points that I saw from the Reddit AMA, skill points can be earned in World vs. World. I don't know how they're going to do that, but I guess maybe you kill enough players, you get a skill point or something. Because they did say you can level all the way in World vs. World and not have to ever go into the PvE section. And uh, so I was wondering how they were going to let you earn skill points. So maybe there are skill points in the, in the World vs. World maps. Who knows? Um... Let's see, there's this cool squad system where anybody can sort of announce themselves as a general or a commander, as they call it, and other people can just select that person and basically choose join that person's squad, and bam, you're in. There's no like, let me just do, okay, invite Tommy, okay, did you get Gene? How's he spell his name? I don't know, man, message him, is he AFK? Is he in the bathroom? I don't know how to get to his stupid name. So you don't have to do that. Just, you know, have them click you and bam, they just join your... your I assume there's probably also going to be a way to join them uh, via a command, but that's going to make it easy for people to join sort of just ad hoc groups in World versus World. If you're just following somebody around, if you see a group attacking a keep, there's somebody there that's a commander. You just click on them so that you can be in the same group chat with everybody and talk with them and stay connected. So it's going to be very simple to make ad, ad hoc... Ad, ad hoc raid groups wow okay we got to end this wrap this up so that's kind of cool <laughs> um also every single beta test that they are going to have in march and april is going to test world versus world so i am super excited uh any final thoughts guys before we wrap this up beta. Promising future. <laughs> beta. <laughs> so <laughs> i've been thinking about the beta if we get in, we can't talk about it, <laughs> according to the no. NDA. So if, if we were to get in, how are we going to do a show next week? I don't know. We'll have to because, be very cloak and dagger. What we could do is, though, is that we saw. This is the worst <laughs> part, because if you do a show, then you'll have nothing to talk about but beta stuff. If you don't do a show, then you're telling people you were in beta, which is against I the know. rules. I know! Oh, so no, we'll have to do a, a tricky show. <laughs> oh, no! They're, they're setting us up, Roger. You just don't see it yet. You know, it, if we don't do a show, everybody's going to know we were in beta. And that's very clearly on the Twitter. Uh, says you're not allowed to do that, so we're doomed. It, it's... It's over, man. Damned if you do, <laughs> damned if you don't. Game over. It's going to be the worst episode ever. We're going to be like, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be like, hang on, let me make sure there's a public source before I comment. <laughs> oh, man. 
I don't know. We'll find out. What I do want to do, actually, is um, assuming that the podcasting, that some members of the podcast get into the beta somehow, I want to record our reactions audio-wise, uh, sort of in an, in, a, in an MP3 form, and then we can't release that, obviously, until the NDA comes down. Um, not including any major details, but just like, oh, this is awesome, and here's why. It's just like stories. The same kinds of stuff that was released later. So hopefully, when the NDA comes down, you'll get some really cool reaction videos from us if we were to get into the beta, but we'll have to solve next week's show when we get to it. Uh, I think that is it, ladies and gentlemen, for us tonight. We had a little bit of a long episode here as well, it should seem, and uh, I do apologize for that. I do try to keep them to an hour, and hopefully when we get more steady, like, hey, we've been in the game and nothing's exciting anymore, we'll stick to an hour, 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> But as long as everything's new and exciting, we're going to have to keep going <laughs> for as long as it takes every week. Uh, let us, <laughs> this is Bridger signing <laughs> off. Remember, send us a review on iTunes or uh, click the like button, click the subscribe button on, uh, on YouTube. We really appreciate it. For Bridger, for everybody else, have a good one. Good night. And we'll see, see you everyone. in beta, or will we? Hmm. I, we don't know. It's a, it's a good problem I want to have. <laughs>